Hidden in the forest, in the Essex countryside, sits a nice little 1950s cottage. It's the perfect hideaway to get away from that busy city life. But that's not the reason that this place was top secret for 40 years. Because the cottage isn't actually a cottage. It's actually the entrance to an underground bunker, designed to provide shelter to 600 people, including the Prime Minister, in the event of a nuclear apocalypse. And so while this place was never used for its intended purpose, thankfully, it seems that some didn't get the memo that it's safe to go up to the surface, as there has been talk that the secret nuclear bunker in Kelvedon Hatch is haunted. But by what? And so to really get into this story, I need to give you a little bit of wider context about what was going on in the world that led to this bunker being built. Because after the Second World War ended in 1945, there was trouble a brewing between the two superpowers of the world, the capitalist America and the communist Soviet Union. America at the time was the only kid on the playground with an atomic bomb, and they'd just proven how effective they were when they dropped two in Japan, one on Hiroshima and one on Nagasaki. But after the end of the Second World War, Stalin was pushing his communist ideology, like he didn't trust the West, and so he started installing communist governments all across Eastern Europe, which didn't sit too well with us in the West, so mainly America, the capitalist capital of the world, and obviously their allies, including us in Great Britain. But the Cold War didn't end up being this like out and out fight between the two sides like World War One and Two had been. It was more of a, I need to stay one step ahead of you so you don't think I'm weak enough to attack with your nuclear weapons kind of thing. Because obviously by this point, the Soviet Union had its own nuclear weapons program and the West then needed to react to that and so on. So one of the kind of vital components of keeping up in the Cold War on our side in Great Britain was that we needed to obviously keep an eye on the Soviet Union. We needed to make sure that we knew the second that a Soviet bomber was in our airspace and could potentially be coming to wipe our little island off the map forever. And so I'm just going to take a second here to let the gravity of that hanging over your head sink in. Like at any moment while you're living your life, a bomb could be dropped and you'd be vaporised. So you can see why the stakes were so high. If these guys launch a nuclear attack on us, we need as much notice as possible to obviously A, try and intercept them, and B, also then nuke them into oblivion in retaliation. And that's where the RAF rotor stations came in, which was where they would use a radar system to basically keep an eye on the Soviet Union. They'd keep track of where the Soviet bombers were and if they were getting a little uncomfortably close, which they tended to do every now and then. The rotor station would relay the information to RAF base where they would scramble the jets to go and intercept, because they couldn't afford to not take each threat seriously. Any one of these Soviet bombers could be carrying nuclear weapons that they were ready to drop on us. And we knew this was the case because it was exactly what the Americans had done in Japan. They'd flown bombers overhead in the weeks leading up to the attack on Hiroshima. So when the day did come that they dropped the bomb, everyone on the ground was so used to the Americans flying overhead that they were just going about their day before being absolutely obliterated. So we were no strangers to what was potentially going on. And this fun little game also served the Russians as they used these little like back and forth, these little will they won't they games to gather intel on how quickly we could could respond to their threats. But obviously, if the threat was real and they weren't just gathering intel, they were actually there to nuke us, these rotor stations needed to stay protected. Maybe like deep underground? Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. They decided that Kelvedon Hatch would be a good location as it sat 25 miles out from London and six miles away from RAF Northfield Airfield. So it was close enough to an RAF base, but more importantly, it was close, but just far enough away from London to avoid a direct nuclear bomb. So in 1952, the RAF approached Jim Parrish, a farmer who had farmed 2000 acres around Brentwood in Essex. And this was his family's land, like his daddy had farmed it and his daddy's daddy had farmed it before him. But basically the suits rocked up and were like, we are buying these 25 acres from you. And it's 1952, like the memories of both World War One and Two were very fresh in Jim's mind. So he was like, could have picked literally anywhere else instead of my farm, but okay. If that's the price to pay for not having another world war, so be it. And so they started to build a cottage deep within the forest on what used to be Jim Parrish's land. And if you happen to stumble upon it in the forest, not that you would, because you probably wouldn't have been allowed that close to it. But if you did, you wouldn't think anything of it because from the outside, it looks just like a nice little secluded cottage, which 
dream house, can I just say, isolated little cottage in the middle of the forest, and then a huge secret underground bunker that can survive a nuclear holocaust. You would never see me in person again. Like, that's the dream. But then if you enter the cottage, you very quickly realise that it is actually just a facade. It's not real. I mean, it is a real building that was used as the guard house, but it's actually the entrance to the secret bunker. So you'd go into the cottage and through the big blast door into this 100 metre long tunnel that would sort of like take you underground. And at the end of the tunnel, is a dog leg, which initially I thought was just a typo in the subtitles or something, but a dog leg is actually where a corridor will bend, kind of like a dog leg. Imaginative. So basically it acted as a way to remove some of the power out of the blast of like a nuclear bomb and reduce the pressure on the blast doors to hopefully keep the people inside the bunker safe. It was also a super handy way of giving the military the best opportunity to defend against desperate civilians who weren't on the list, but had managed to get into the tunnel during their final few moments and were just trying to get to safety in the bunker before the bombs dropped. Like it's just this one long straight corridor with no like turn offs or other doors into rooms or anything. And this is so that there is nowhere for civilians to hide. And it just makes it easier for armed guards to shoot you from having the audacity of trying to survive. Cheerful. I know. But if you were one of the lucky few RAF personnel whose name was on the list in the event of a nuclear attack in the early 50s, you'd be protected by walls that were 10 feet thick and up to like 100 foot underground. You'd also be surrounded by a Faraday cage to keep you safe from the burst of electromagnetic radiation from the bomb itself, known as the electromagnetic pulse, which could have the potential of permanently frying all of your computers and electronic equipment, which you kind of need. And so when they first built this rotor station in the 50s, the bottom floor of the bunker had like a huge great big map on it with people like moving the little monopoly counters around the table to show where the Soviet bombers were. And then the two floors above it would have had windows so that people could see down onto the lower floor to check up on where the planes had last been picked up. And at any one time, there would be about 100 personnel down in the bunker during its time as a rotor station, analyzing information, weather patterns, and all that sort of stuff, and relaying that back to the RAF airfields. But technology quickly moved on. It needed to. We needed to stay ahead of the other side. Which didn't just mean weaponry, it also meant the technology needed to keep an eye on the enemy. Radar became more sophisticated and eventually meant that they didn't need these special rotor stations anymore. They could have their radar systems like directly on the airfields, meaning that the RAF could react to information like immediately. They could get their planes up in the air and flying towards any threats so much faster. And so the RAF didn't need the bunker anymore, but the Cold War is still going on. And this is a perfectly good bunker. It's just over 10 years old at this point. And then in October, 1962, things really took a turn. Because the Soviet Union parked up a bunch of nuclear weapons in Cuba, which is less than 100 miles away from the coast of Florida. So America kind of took this as an escalation, obviously. Things were getting very real, and the possibility of all-out nuclear war was looking more and more likely by the day. The technology of these weapons had moved on too. Like, you wouldn't be alerted to the fact that you were about to be bombed by the manned bomber plane that was, like, flying up in the sky. We were moving more and more towards intercontinental missiles, where you could just push a button and a rocket of death would be launched at your enemy from the comfort of your own little underground lair. So now countries needed to get prepared. This standoff known as the Cuba Missile Crisis, it only lasted 13 days and was the closest that the two sides actually got to pressing the big red buttons. But even so, after the Soviets took the missiles back home in late 1962, there's no guarantee that they won't try something like that again. And so America and all of their allies like us, we needed to be prepared for that. So in 1963, the bunker at Kelvedon Hatch was taken over by the British government and became the sub-regional headquarters. Which means that basically, if World War III did happen and the Soviets did decide to drop nuclear bombs on us, there would be like little sub-regions within the UK that would be kind of looked after by a group of officials, like senior civil servants, and they would all be overlooked by a guy called the Commissioner. They'd be in charge of kind of like restarting life as best they could in their little region, dealing out like remaining supplies and things like like that. And so obviously now this bunker at Kelvedon Hatch isn't for keeping an eye on the sky, it's for keeping a few people safe in case the worst happens. So they put floors in on the middle and the top floors so there wasn't that big well where people could like look down at the Monopoly counters anymore. And with this extra space, they made a few other modifications to the bunker as well, including adding in some dorms. 
So if the bunker was needed, they'd have 450 people sheltering in it, but only a third of them would be asleep at any one time. And because obviously space is a premium, you can't give every single person their own bed. So they use their dorm rooms a bit like your WeWork office. You'd hot desk, but for beds. So basically just find a free bed and go to sleep when it's your turn to. The bunker also had a sick bay. Like if you're living in confined spaces with hundreds of other people for a few months, injuries and illnesses are bound to happen. And so it would basically just do its best to patch you up and send you on your way. Or it would have likely put you out of your misery if needed. The world that's left after a nuclear apocalypse is gonna be very unforgiving. And if it looks like you might not survive, they're probably gonna have some pretty tough decisions to make. Like use up food, water, and medical supplies on someone that's gonna die eventually or put an end to their suffering now. Yeah, it really wasn't all sunshine and rainbows for the survivors that did make it into the bunker. Another key role that the Kelvin Hatch bunker would have had in the event of all out nuclear war was helping to get information out to the public on what to do. So they actually had a whole BBC broadcasting studio where they could broadcast messages and tell the public what they needed to do, where they needed to go, how to survive as best they could. Not that there would have been much public left and then whether they actually had access to a working radio. I think those are some big assumptions right there. Like in the 1984 film Threads, it was dark, but I think it gives you a really probably realistic view of what would have happened if we got bombed. Like for all the preparation and the bunkers and the secrecy, I think Threads got a lot of it right. I think there would have been anarchy. I think people would have been shot in the street for scavenging houses for food. I think government would completely collapse and there wouldn't be any proper distribution systems for food and medical supplies. It would just be an all around bleak situation and probably the end of humanity. Because if we got bombed, we wouldn't be the only ones. We would have retaliated before we got annihilated or one of our allies would have, and the resulting war from that would have wiped us all out in mutually assured destruction. You can tell I've had real fun researching this one and not crying myself to sleep about the state of the world right now with all those nuclear weapons floating about out there. But the bunker would undergo another transformation in the 80s. The Cold War's still raging on, the threat of nuclear apocalypse still hanging very heavy. In 1985, it became the regional government headquarters for the metropolitan area, which is basically a more extended version of the sub-regional headquarters. So originally, the first plan that they had created was that if the alarm was sounded and a nuclear attack was imminent, central government would be shipped off to the Burlington bunker under RAF Corsham in Wiltshire. And then the prime minister would have joined them like at the last possible minute by helicopter. But for some reason, they suspected that the Russians actually knew about this bunker, which kind of defeats the point. Like you're going to a secret underground bunker to hide from the missiles away from what you think would be the target area and then pray you don't get a direct hit. But if the Russians knew where this bunker was and all of the most important people would be in it, they would probably be more than likely to aim a missile directly at the bunker, which would remove it from existence. Because this is the thing about these bunkers. They're great for surviving the initial blast and the radioactive fallout that had happened, say like if London got bombed. But if a nuclear bomb was detonated directly on you, nothing was going to save you, underground bunker or not. So whether it was Burlington or another bunker in the country, if the Russians did get a direct hit on whichever bunker had the entire central government in it, then you'd all be completely wiped out. So in 1986, the Python plan was created where the country was split up into 18 regions, each with their own bunker. So the plan was that the government would be split off and sent into each region so that even if one region's bunker fell, there would still be others there to help try and calm the anarchy in the apocalypse. Kelvedon Hatch became the bunker that would have looked after the London region, so would probably have been the bunker that the Prime Minister would have used. And so while a lot of the information about the running of the bunker back in the day is obviously classified, we do know that the Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher visited the bunker. Which, yeah, makes sense for Maggie to go and check out her potential digs in case the nuclear threat became real, and probably on that, all of the other Prime Ministers probably would have visited at some point, just so they knew where they would be coming in the event of a nuclear war. And then apparently the Duke of Edinburgh visited the bunker at Kelvedon Hatch. Again, probably like a briefing thing maybe. But then there was also a car ferry that had been fortified as a floating nuclear bunker up in one of the Scottish sea locks. And as the royal family commonly go up to Balmoral and a floating nuclear bunker would keep them safe from any radioactive fallout plumes, like they could just float away, maybe they were actually penciled in for a nice little cruise in Scotland should the apocalypse happen. And maybe the Duke of Edinburgh just fancied a nosy around Kelvedon Hatch. And this new phase of the bunker's life in the 80s, it was just a bigger and more sophisticated version of what it had 
had been doing since the 60s, just for more people. So they made a few modifications again, including adding in more private bedrooms for important people. The commissioner, who would have most likely been a government minister, a principal officer, who would have been an advisor, and then the prime minister. Those three people would have had their own private bedrooms slash offices, but they would have earned it. They would have been on call 24 hours a day. If they were needed, they would have had to be woken up and go straight back to work. And so now at this point, the bunker could house up to 600 people. And these were hand-picked civil servants that earned a place in the bunker based on their expertise. They needed people that were actually going to have the best chance of clawing back some semblance of normality after the bombs had been dropped. But it would have been those people and those people only. They couldn't bring family or friends with them. It was just that person. Which, can I just say, what a decision to make. Go and do your job, have the best chance of survival locked underground for three months, and know that out there on the surface, your entire family is probably dead or abandon your post and get vaporized together as a family. And if that doesn't kill you, the fallout or other survivors probably will. Bleak. It was still a tough choice to make though, even if you did have a place in the underground bunker. Being in the underground bunker though, like that didn't guarantee your survival. They had planned for all eventualities if all out nuclear war did happen. And so there was a locked strong room in the bunker that would have been where state secrets were kept. Obviously just because there's no state anymore doesn't mean we're gonna risk these secrets getting out. But apparently it was also where the cyanide capsules for all 600 people would have been kept. And think about it, like once the bomb has been dropped, the world you knew is most likely gone forever. If a nuclear missile was launched at us, it wouldn't be like Hiroshima where, although it was absolutely devastating, the radiation decayed quickly and it was reasonably inhabitable again quite soon after. The world is playing with much bigger nukes nowadays. More radioactive fallout, more devastation, and not to mention the fact that we and our allies can retaliate. Obviously Japan didn't have nukes so they couldn't retaliate back then. And so that means that the first country to launch a nuclear attack would probably be the country to bring about the end of the world. So it's probably more than likely that when these people emerge from the Kelvedon Hatch bunker, three months after the bombs have been dropped, dropped, because that's how long the bunker was designed to sustain them for, there's going to be nothing there. No one to govern, no food or medical supplies to distribute, no chance at starting society back up again. And so a cyanide capsule would have looked like a pretty decent exit plan rather than suffering a slow and brutal death from radiation sickness and starvation. Like I said, pretty bleak, very brutal. But what actually happened? It's quite clearly no one decided that today was a good day to end the world, thankfully, even with the incredibly tense Cuban Missile Crisis. The Cold War never escalated to anything more apocalyptic than just a lot of tension and fingers hovering over big red buttons, I'd assume. By the end of the 80s, the Berlin Wall was pulled down, communist governments had been kicked out of European countries, and in 1991, the Soviet Union dissolved. And everyone finally started to breathe again. During this whole time though, the bunker at Kelvedon Hatch had been kept running in the background, just in case. But it cost up to three million pounds a year just to stay operational. And now that everyone had put the little safety caps back over their big red buttons, the bunker was decommissioned in 1992. The parish family who'd owned the land before and who'd continued to farm their remaining land around it, they brought the bunker back off the government and turned it into a museum. And while, yeah, it used to be a secret, now it's actually known as a secret nuclear bunker. Like literally, there's forest signs pointing you directly to the secret bunker now. And it's kind of mocked up like it would have been when it was a regional government headquarters, ready and waiting. And I haven't been able to go down yet, but I would absolutely love to. I cannot believe I lived less than 20 minutes away from it while I was at university, and I still didn't know about it. Even with all those big brown tourist signs, it was still a secret to me, apparently. But what isn't a secret is how the place is apparently super haunted. There are a few entities that have made their presence known to paranormal investors investigators and visitors of the museum, including that of a pretty angry woman wearing an RAF uniform. She'll stride right up to you, get in your face and scream at you, demanding that you tell her exactly who you are and why you are in this top secret classified bunker. And then she'll turn and march away. But like she's proper in your face about it and just not very nice. So visitors will go to the end of the museum and just go to the staff like, I think your actor's having a bad day. Like she was a bit much. To which obviously they are then informed that there are no actors employed by the museum. There's also a gray figure of an elderly man or woman. It changes depending on who you ask. They all say though that the figure is unusually tall. They seem to be wearing a grey robe and they move from room to room within the bunker with the smell of rotting flesh following them. Apparently there are also loads of loud bangs that are heard 
whenever the figure walks into a room. There are so many reports of like disembodied voices, footsteps, and even growls. And then there's the poltergeist activity. Apparently, while a paranormal investigator was in the medical bay, they watched a light switch turn off right in front of them. And the medical bay seems to be a really active spot with lots of dark shadows seen flitting about, as well as something a little more sinister, maybe? Apparently you get the sense that something evil is watching you and that it really doesn't like you in that area. But there's one really interesting encounter that's reported quite a lot, and it's that it seems like the bunker is bustling with life just a few doors down from the room that you're in right now. It's claimed by paranormal investigators, so it's once the day visitors have like gone home and the museum has been shut. So there shouldn't be talking coming from any other room kind of thing. But you'll be in one room, just sitting there silently, and then you'll start hearing the distant sounds as if it's just like a room full of people working, like a few doors down from where you are. But you'll go and try and find this really busy room and of course there'll be nothing there. Very strange. There's also been shadows that have been seen in the BBC broadcasting room and apparently this photo seems to capture a shadow between the beds in a dorm room. The paranormal investigator that took this photo says that it wasn't the first time that she'd seen him in the bunker that night. Laura Goff was leading a paranormal investigation with her partner and saw this shadow who she just assumed was her other half. So she called out to him and got no answer. And she was a bit like, uh, excuse me, I'm talking to you, hello. She walked right up to him being like, why are you here? Why have you left your side of the group on their own? Like, what's going on? The shadow was in fact not her partner. It turned to her, snarled in her face and walked forwards through a solid wall. So definitely not her partner. A bit later on, she saw this shadow again, and that's when she took that picture, which appeared to capture what Laura and the group that she was leading all witnessed. Which is pretty creepy, right? But with all of these stories, I still just can't shake the question of why. Why is this place haunted? Obviously it was never used for its intended purpose. It didn't shelter people from an all out nuclear war, but there are a few theories that attempt to give some explanation. So the first one is that yes, it was never used as a shelter from nuclear attack, but it was still manned. There were still people working within the bunker, keeping it operational, keeping an eye on the rest of the world, all while nuclear war was a very real possibility. At any moment, the alarms could be sounded and those blast doors closed for three months. That's gonna be an awful lot of tension and some big emotions by the people that are working there. Could it be that it's this energy that's still down there and this playing back is a residual type of haunting? Because to me, that does seem to provide a good explanation for the moments where you'd hear all the staff like busily working away in a room down the hallway or something, right? There were also no confirmed deaths that happened down there, but with its top secret classification, it wouldn't be any surprise that if anyone had died down there, those records may not have ever seen the light of day. Because apparently there's a quite famous story of a supposed foreman who was working on the construction of the bunker back in the 50s. And like we said at the start, these are 10 foot thick walls. They would have been pouring concrete night and day. Apparently this foreman guy had gone missing the night before. There was no trace of him, like no one could find him which ain't great if you're working in a super secure facility and they manage to lose you. But in the morning, they allegedly found his hard hat poking out the top of wet concrete. And so now maybe the haunting is something to do with this foreman, which I don't know, it just seems like an exaggerated and embellished story. Could there actually be a foreman that accidentally fell into the wet concrete? Possibly, but I just get the feeling for me, it's that little detail about the hard hat being found. And like the quote is that it's floating on top of wet concrete in the morning, which just makes me think, nah, that sounds like an embellishment, like just to make the story seem juicier and just throws the whole story into question for me. It could be that I'm being too cynical and that is actually what happened, but I don't know. It's just got a ring of sound sensational. That's the story anyway. I don't know. It just doesn't sit quite right with me. There's also another rumor about a death, but this one isn't as widely copied and pasted everywhere. Stop being so cynical, Claire. Apparently at some point in the bunker's history, maybe when it was first being built or when it was undergoing one of its remodeling phases, there was a construction worker who killed himself in the staircase. That's it though. Like those are all the details I have. So again, skeptical. I think honestly, one's got too much detail and one's got not enough. Look, my gut says what my gut says, all right? That's just how I feel. One theory that really did pique my attention though was that it's haunted by something ancient. Because there is a rumor that the small hill that the cottage, like the guardhouse, was built on 
and what they then had to like dig out so that they could put the bunker in was actually an ancient burial ground. And it's interesting though, because there were actually archeological excavations done around Kelvedon Hatch, and they found evidence of a late Iron Age settlement in the area, as well as the actual remains of an Iron Age warrior. So obviously if there was a settlement there, they would have needed a place to bury their dead. And then maybe that hill was the burial mound. And then maybe no one will either confirm or deny it because any evidence that they did or didn't find during its construction would have been like massively top secret, like the tippity top secret. So there is that theory. But then, Another theory, it's an underground bunker. There's an element of claustrophobia. You're deep underground, only one way out. Is your mind starting to panic a little bit and you're seeing and hearing things that aren't there? Noises are gonna echo in weird ways. There might be cold drafts in strange places. I don't know. It's a theory that I need to point out that it could all just be in people's heads. Pretty much like any of my stories to the most hardened of skeptics, I guess. So while the reason why the secret nuclear bunker at Kelvedon Hatch is haunted seems to be pretty disputed, and in itself the very fact of whether it is actually haunted at all, almost everyone agrees that the bunker is a very dark reminder of the state of the world not too long ago, which only adds to its unsettling atmosphere once you're a hundred foot underground. But as always, I want to know what you think. Is the secret nuclear bunker haunted? What's haunting it? Have you been? Did you experience anything while you were there? Or do you know someone that used to work there when it was operational? While I was doing the research for this one, I got way into the Cold War side of things and the threat of nuclear attack during the 80s especially. Because obviously you had that informational film Protect and Survive with that ominous sounding synth. Oh my god, that is going to be in my nightmares. <laughs> watch the films when the wind blows and of course threads i posted that on my instagram and it turns out that pretty much everyone seems to agree that yeah threads is the perfect easy breezy sunday afternoon feel good film i'm so glad i wasn't the only one that felt sorry for the cat but i feel like even that reaction to this day people are still remembering the impact that threads had and that kind of sums up for me the feeling of unease of waking up not knowing if today was going to be the day that you and your family would be erased off the face of the earth. So with Kelvedon Hatch Bunker, I do think that it is haunted, but not necessarily in that sense of a spirit of a person is prowling the corridors kind of thing. I feel like potentially that emotion that the workers would have been feeling, like they would have had a better idea than you or me of how close we actually were to nuclear annihilation at any one time. So I feel like that fear, that unease, that potentially even panic at times, that's what could be causing this apparent paranormal activity. And that it's more residual echoes of that time in history. But that is just my opinion, and I'd love to hear yours. And so if you enjoyed learning about how this unassuming little cottage had a fair deal to do with Britain's defence against the apocalypse, why don't you let me know by leaving a little like on this video, and maybe a subscribe too if you're feeling that way inclined and you fancy catching up over history and ghosts again. But that is all from me today, so until next time, sleep safe. I feel like I'm saying obviously a lot in my uh, videos at the minute. It's not obvious. I know it's not obvious. Or maybe it is, and I'm just dumb.